everyone. This is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency. We're here with an up-to-date 2050 climate forecast for all of our friends in Alaska. This forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment, which was just updated. You can see the website here. I'm going to say the name of every figure that I'm going to be using. And if you want to check it out for yourself, maybe download it and zoom in closer, you can go to Chapters and scroll down here to a shortcut where you'll be able to see all of the figures. So the National Climate Assessment, it was just updated. We received the fifth National Climate Assessment in November of 2023. The fifth National Climate Assessment represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for it. Today, we're breaking it down for Alaska. And let me get real with you. The Alaska chapter of the NCA5, which is chapter 29, it describes a very intense level of change happening now. There is an overall adjustment to the outlook that we saw in the NCA4. Alaska's statewide annual average surface air temperature is now projected to increase by over eight degrees by the end of the century under an intermediate scenario, an RCP 4.5 scenario, relative to temperatures in the 80s to 2010. That projection is a 2.5 degree increase compared to comparable regional projections in the NCA4. That's a big jump. But, you know, that's talking about an end of century change. Let's focus in. What do we expect at mid-century? Let's start by looking at figure 1.14 to check that out. Figure 1.14, we can see this box for Alaska where we see that average winter temperatures are projected to increase by 4.8 degrees by mid-century. The biggest change in Alaska is coming to winter rather than summer temperatures. And we can see with this gradient of colors that as you get further north, the change is going to be most intense with the most warming, the most loss of cold happening the further north you go. Getting some more clarity on how that change is going to fall, let's look at figure 2.11. We can see that although we are expecting increased temperatures in Alaska, none of them are likely to come in form of days over 95 degrees year over year. We're not likely to see any more nights over 70 degrees in Alaska. It's all in reduction of cold days, reduction of days below 32, where we expect about another month at least above freezing in Alaska by 2 degrees C, which is our most likely mid-century climate future. So Alaska is warming, but it's warming to a point. This is not like a palm tree forecast for Alaska. Let's also check out your expected changes to precipitation for these states. These changes are significant for Alaska and they do vary a lot. As we explore precipitation, first we're looking at figure 4.3, where we're looking at how many more or less inches of rain are you expecting to fall. We can see that in Alaska, there is a lot of increased rain coming, particularly down in Southern Alaska. This area here in Southern Alaska has been highlighted as a relatively low change potential climate destination -y part of Alaska. Although we see the highest change in precipitation towards the north, we see that in terms of inches of rain, where we're getting the most inches of precipitation added, that is towards the south, where you might, if you're in Alaska, want to download these figures and zoom in. You can see that if they're downloaded, you can get a pretty high degree of granularity to see where you're going to fall in terms of these change bands of how much precipitation to expect. And with climate, we're always interested in these extreme storms, these storms that drop a ton of precipitation at once. I think that this is very significant for Alaska. We can see that they basically had to make a new color on the map for Alaska, showing a 50% increase in total precipitation on the heaviest 1% of days. So when we're talking about the changing water cycle on the warming Earth, Alaska is getting really hit both with increased rain and increased intensity of precipitation. Moving back to 4.3 and kind of zooming in on Alaska, I want to note that all of these areas that are expecting maybe five additional inches of rain, they're already very wet. So it's not as if we're going to dump another five inches of rain on Tempe, Arizona, right? We're talking about areas that like Juneau, Alaska, downtown, they get 90 plus inches of rain a year. So adding five inches to that, it's not the same infrastructure challenge it would be for a non-rainforest environment. In thinking about stability in that rainforest type environment down there in Southern Alaska, I wanna look at figure 4.5. In figure 4.5, we're talking about projected changes in maximum annual snow water equivalent by mid-century. A lot of ecosystems around the mountains, they get a lot of water from snowmelt. We can see that we're expecting 
a loss of snow melt water in this area uh, that is proportional, negative three to five inches to the increased rain. So that gives us some hope of potential balance. We also see that Northern Alaska is one of the few parts of the United States where we do see a potential for increase in snowmelt equivalent water. So this is a complicated emerging picture, this water picture in Alaska. In the relatively more populated, relatively lower temperature change parts of Alaska, there's an element of balance to this emerging water picture. However, this rain-snow relationship and how it's changing is a serious situation for Alaska because the way we're already getting and likely to continue to get rain as well as snow is different from how it's fallen before in Alaska and it's impacting travel and infrastructure. This figure, this is 29.6, this shows a cross section of repeated rain on snow events in Fairbanks. So Fairbanks is in a higher change area of Alaska than Juneau, it's more inland. In Fairbanks, they're used to snow. They can get snow off the roads, but rain on snow situations creates the layers of ice you see in this figure. And these ice layers can be thick. Look at this. This is like more than an inch of ice layered on top of the snow. It can make cleanup very difficult. Again, Fairbanks knows how to deal with snow. They're very comfortable getting snow off the roads. But this rain and snow mix that they dealt with in the winter of 2021, 2022, it kept an inch of ice on the roads some places until the spring of 2022. This is a major public impact that's happening now because of these changes in precipitation. Before we talk more about the challenges emerging from these big changes in temperature and precipitation, let's get another basic physical projection and let's talk about sea level rise. We have a nice clear update on that in figure 9.2. Check this out, figure 9.2, they have like a zoom in on Alaska, but it's not a little zoom in. It's like actual details for you, Alaska. We can see that sea level rise by uh, 2050 under intermediate scenario, RCP 4.5 scenario, we're talking about um, a lot of local variability. And we're talking about in several places, a decrease in sea level because Alaska always is doing things weird, right? Unfortunately, a drop in sea level rise is not always great either, as we can see here in figure 29.9. It's related to the very extreme coastal erosion that we're seeing in parts of Alaska. Look at this scale. Maximum erosion rate feet per year. Lose 72.8 feet of coast per year? It's crazy. This causes real damage to coastal communities and erosion, you can imagine with those very extreme increasing precipitation events that you have a big erosion problem, not just coastally, but inland in Alaska. There are many communities on rivers that are dealing with tremendous riverbank erosion. So this is a wild picture for Alaska where extreme precipitation is driving extreme erosion, where we have erosion on the coasts, we have erosion in the rivers, we have substantial changes occurring to land in the places where most people live. Although we do see relative stability in that most densely populated part of Southern Alaska. The overall picture for the state is one of super high change. We can easily see that the farther north you get, the more extreme change you're gonna encounter. Transformational change, and it's already occurring. To see the extent to which the change has already occurred, we're gonna look at figure 29.11. I really like this figure to show a level of change. I want you to look with me at the moose line here. I think that this is a very easy and significant way to see the difference. The moose habitat has moved from this blue line, this light blue line, up to the dark blue line. That's how much moose range has increased. And if you've ever run across a moose, you know that a moose is an animal that needs to eat, right? Like a moose is not carrying a backpack full of protein bars. When moose are roaming around, they have to eat all the time and they're huge. So they have huge energy needs and they're eating huge amounts of plants whenever they're moving around, increasing this range. So moose range shifting that far north means that that landscape has already changed tremendously throughout this huge portion of the state to support moose. This increase in shrubland, it has to be just enormous on the ground. So this figure 29.11, it's important. We can see there are changes occurring in Alaska that are catastrophic. There are populations noted here that are collapsing. Look at those notes on those fisheries collapse, it's horrible. 
But there are always winners in any system of intense change. In the Alaskan interior, this appears to be a great time to be a shrub. I mean, you might get eaten by a moose, but look how much new territory is opening up for shrubs. We can see changes that are potentially positive, maybe also for caribou, for some fish species. Anytime that there's change, someone's gonna find an opportunity. And that's true for people as well as shrubs, of course. Tremendous change is going to happen in Alaska. It's locked in. We're gonna see a transformation of the seas around Alaska away from ice-based ecosystems. And there's gonna be a lot of loss with that. Alongside the loss though, there's not gonna be a vacuum. The change is not gonna be only death. Other species, species from farther south will also be rushing into the area, both by land and sea. In the ocean, we expect particularly big increases in species that are tolerant of ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is a huge problem around Alaska. It's a bigger problem than anywhere else in the world. The world's worst ocean acidification is currently happening in our Arctic oceans. It's gotten bad enough that in the Chukansi Sea, the acidified waters are really hurting the organisms. They're hurting crabs. Shells of crabs are weakening in the Chukansi Sea now. They're essentially dissolving. And in a citation-rich passage of the NCA-5, we are able to learn that crabs don't like it when their bodies get dissolved. It turns out that being dissolved negatively impacts their growth. It's a shocker. I'm surprised we needed so many citations for that. The level of change we're talking about on land and in the sea around Alaska is hard to know exactly what's going to happen. You'd have to have an Alaska-sized risk tolerance to want to get into it. With this level of change, there are going to be people who win big, people who get onto land that's opening up in a good way, where they're able to nurture landscape transformation. But they're going to be facing many challenges. And the NCA-5 spends a lot of time documenting current change. In Alaska, many people hunt, fish, and gather as significant food sources because food at the store is very expensive up there. And this traditional way of living with the land, the indigenous way of living of the land, it's, it's very much a lived experience today. There's a huge population in Alaska of native people who are living in traditional life ways. This is their home. And this is very emotionally serious for people living in traditional life ways, this level of change. You know, when the berries don't come in well, when you can't gather as much as you normally would, that impacts your nutrition, of course. But it's also an emotional loss. It's a destabilizing loss. And that's not just a theoretical example, like berry yields, gathering yields are way down. Being unable to gather a normal amount of berries is something that quickly becomes a big problem when you can't afford healthy food at the store and when getting to the store is not easy in and of itself. As we talk about these impacts, the emerging challenges related to this transformative level of change, as we talk about change that is destabilizing, we gotta talk about permafrost. As it's getting warmer, we are seeing thawing of permafrost in Alaska. Related to that, we get heave of the permafrost. We got a great picture to show what that means. This is figure 2910 from the NCA5 showing the Pretty Rocks landslide on the road, the road, the one road into Denali. This totally dropped the road by feet, right? Multiple humans high, just totally dropped it down. You can see looking at this, as this poor person appears to be doing, that there is not a super easy repair solution to permafrost heave really messing up your roads. When permafrost heave hits infrastructure, it's not like it just gently sets it down. It messes it up like completely. With these infrastructure disruptions, we can have serious impacts on sanitation. You can imagine that kind of heave is not good for pipes, as well as impacts on roads, homes, other parts of the built environment. And related to these permafrost issues, emerging disease is a problem in Alaska. There are concerns about diseases emerging from the melting permafrost itself. That's a direct threat. There's also an indirect disease threat because as the permafrost heaves, if you lose your sanitary system and there are thousands of people in Alaska without effective plumbing or sanitation, you can't wash your hands. There's a big tribal response to this problem, delivering hand washing stations, drinking water, and chemical toilets to impacted communities. You can see though that that is the sort of response that's a reactive response. It's not a deep adaptive response. And this is where tribal communities, where communities wanna be headed. And there's plants. It's good that there are band-aids for this problem right now, but the people of Alaska are very aware that deeper solutions are needed. 
Another issue though on the disease front though, along with the landscape transformation, there are concerns about formerly rare diseases entering and becoming more common in the state, including rabies. The Alaska chapter of the NCA5, which is clearly written by and for Alaskans, it has this fearless direct tone. It's that it's most Alaskan when it just tosses rabies into the mix. Just another thing to be considered. And I, I kind of love it, honestly. Everything I read in the NCA5 makes me admire Alaskans. The current work being done to ride this level of lived experience change is extraordinary. It shouldn't surprise you that in the face of all these challenges, Alaskans are solving their problems. They're getting to work. There's very little throwing up of hands in this document. If there's a temporary solution that's gonna work, they're doing it, you know? They're not letting perfect be the enemy of the good here in Alaska. These are people who know it's time to get ready. People are working on all fronts. They're working to establish food sovereignty harder than ever. Major grants have been awarded in December of 23 to help Alaskan indigenous communities create the infrastructure needed to process and distribute more of their own food. There's ongoing research and increasingly sensitive, careful management of salmon fisheries. You know, salmon fisheries are essential to life in Alaska. They're extremely local, and some of them have hope in their outlook thanks to this careful local work. Maybe you're not familiar with salmon. Let's look at one. Figure 2912 is kind of fun because it lets you see the proportionality of this Chinook salmon to this man's arm. This is a huge fish. Chinook salmon are very big fish. They can get over 120 pounds. So if you're going to do work with them, you can imagine that's complex research and management work with some very large, very sensitive living things. And of course, there are many kinds of salmon. They have different sizes. They have differences to their life cycles. There's a lot to be learned about all of them so they can be cared for and supported as best we can through these transformational changes. And there are places where this work is paying off. It is happening in the Prince William Sound Pink Salmon Fishery. There, deep knowledge of the fish successfully reported reproductions through extreme conditions in 2019. They got them through a bottleneck year then. Let's hope we've learned enough. We can keep doing it going forward. And if you're in Alaska, you know, you know change is already happening on the ground in a big way. Depending on where you are, I hope that through this video, you'll be able to see what the trends look like heading towards mid-century. Overall, it's going to get warmer everywhere, but we can see where the boundaries are for the lower and higher change areas of the state. The anticipated changes in precipitation, again, are extremely local as are anticipated changes to sea level rise. The communities that thrive in this level of change up in Alaska will be communities that are empowered to respond to these changes on their own. Communities that are committed to their independence, their sovereignty, and that are able to use local on the ground knowledge alongside localized projections. The resilient communities of Alaska are already doing the work and it is hard work, but the way Alaskans are tackling change the change that is happening now should be an inspiration to us all. Alaskans have been making community level climate resilience and adaptation plans on a broad scale since about 2015. It's the work they've been doing on the ground that's helping them hold together in the face of the changes they're experiencing today and that is gonna continue to protect them as we move forward in time. A forward facing action oriented outlook alongside an ability to recognize and anticipate change, that's what all our communities need. Alaska is a change leader. We can all take inspiration from them. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for listening. I want to take a minute to thank everyone who contributes so much to the AR community. All of the donors, all of the volunteers, everyone who's helping to get the word out. We have so many great projects going on right now that can only be done with volunteer assistance. Our organization has grown to the point where without the financial help of viewers like you, we would really not be able to sustain operations. Thanks so much for being here with me so that we can do our best and get ready together for the changes that are coming. Talk with you again soon.